Informing the patient. Good. The examination should be explained to the patient before beginning the procedure. Prior to performing any procedure, the dental hygienist should provide the patient with the following information. Number one, what is the procedure? Number two, why is it being done? And number three, how will it be done? The information provided must be appropriate for the patient's level of understanding. Positioning the patient. Position the patient in an upright seated position. The patient should support the weight of her own head throughout the extraoral examination procedure. Examination of structures and detection of enlarged nodes or masses is difficult when the patient's head rests against the dental chair. Ask the patient to remove her glasses and to loosen clothing that limits examination of the neck. Establish consistency using a sequence. It is important to approach the extraoral clinical examination in a systematic manner. The examiner should establish a routine sequence for all examinations to ensure that no structure is accidentally omitted during the exam. There is no one correct sequence. However, the sequence selected should be logical and efficient. The dental hygienist should don protective eyewear, gloves, mask, and overgown before beginning the extraoral clinical exam. Donning PPE. The dental hygienist should don protective eyewear, gloves, mask, and overgown before pre beginning the extraoral examination. The clinician should perform a thorough hand wash prior to donning personal protective equipment. It is important to wear an overgown, mask, and glasses for the extra oral examination. donning all protective equipment, glasses, mask, and overgown, a hand wash should be completed prior to donning a set of gloves. dry each hand so the gloves slide on easily. Note how the gloves should cover the wrists by pulling them over the cuffs of the overgown. The facial form, skin, and hair. Stand in front of the patient. Complete a general appraisal of the face, head, and neck, including inspection of the facial form, the skin, and hair. The patient should be questioned about the time of onset, duration, and possible cause of any nodule ulceration, scars, okay. or other surface variations on the skin.
Measuring scars and lesions. Lesions should be measured using a probe. Use caution not to touch the probe to the face. Record all measurements in the dental chart. The eyes. Stand in front of the patient. Visually inspect the patient's eyes. Note lens opacities, color changes of the sclera, and pupil response to light. The ears. Stand behind the patient. The patient's head should be upright. Visually inspect the ear for abnormal nodules or distortions. Displace the ear forward for visual inspection. Use circular compression to palpate the mastoid process. Pain on palpation could indicate mastoiditis or an ear infection. The occipital lymph nodes. Stand behind the patient. The patient's head should be tipped forward. The patient can assist by holding her hair so the neck is fully visible to the examiner. Palpate by applying circular compressions at the base of the skull, beginning at the midline of the neck, working outward until the sternomastoid muscle is reached. Cover an area of approximately two inches in width, starting above the hairline and ending slightly below the base of the skull. Post-auricular and pre-auricular lymph nodes. Beginning with the post-auricular nodes, use circular motion to compress the tissues between the finger and the bone of the skull. Note that the nodes on both sides of the head may be palpated bilaterally. Palpate the pre-auricular nodes on both sides of the head in a similar manner. Enlarged lymph nodes in these areas may be due to infection of the scalp, the temporal or frontal areas, or the eye. It may also be caused by systemic viral infections such as German measles, chickenpox, and infectious mononucleosis. Okay. Finding the temporomandibular joint. The temporomandibular joint can be found by asking the patient to open and close the mouth. To locate the joint, the examiner should place an index finger just in front of the tragus of each ear. When the patient opens her mouth, the fingertips should drop into the joint spaces. Once the joint is located, the area can be palpated during function. Palpating the temporomandibular joint. Now that the joint has been located, use the fingertips to palpate both joints at the same time. Ask the patient to open and close several times. Move to the front of the patient. Continue palpation and observe the path of opening and note any deviations. Excursions of the temporomandibular joint. Maintaining the same hand position, ask the patient to perform lateral excursions with her mouth open slightly, first to the right and then to the left, and finally in a protrusive movement. Listen and feel for abnormal sounds, popping, clicking, or grating, indicating dysfunction of the masticatory muscles or internal derangement with the capsule of the joint. Range of motion of the temporomandibular joint. Normal range of motion of the TMJ can be assessed by asking the patient to place her own index, middle, and ring fingers between the incisal edges of the upper and lower incisors. Decreased range of motion, swelling, and tenderness may be due to arthritis or internal derangement of the joint. 
the temporalis muscles. Locate these muscles by asking the patient to clench her teeth together. Palpate bilaterally by compressing the tissue against the skull with the fingers. Tenderness can be related to temporomandibular joint dysfunction or stress. The masseter muscles. Locate the masseter muscle by asking the patient to clench her teeth tightly together. Palpate bilaterally by compressing the body of the muscle against the underlying structures. The parotid glands. Palpate bilaterally by compressing the tissue against the cheekbone while applying circular compression. It is important to palpate the entire surface area of these large glands. The normal gland is difficult to recognize by palpation. However, hyperplastic glands or nodules in the glands are palpable. Pain or tenderness may be related to salivary stones, mumps, inflammation, or neoplastic disease. Deviations in gland size, consistency, or tenderness to palpation should be noted. The submental lymph nodes. These nodes are located on either side of the midline of the body of the mandible. Apply upward circular compression to the area behind and beneath the symphysis of the mandible. The submandibular glands. Locate the submandibular salivary gland by finding the slight depression in the inferior border of the mandible and moving the fingers under the chin to locate the gland on both sides of the head. Ask the patient to press the tip of her tongue against the roof of her mouth. Compress the glands upward against the tense mylohyoid and tongue muscles. The submandibular lymph nodes. Evaluate the submandibular lymph nodes on each side of the head using unilateral palpation. With the fingers cupped and the tips Pressed lightly against the mylohyoid muscle, roll the tissue across the inferior border of the mandible. Keeping the fingers in place, allow the tissue to slowly slide over the mandible back into normal position. Palpable nodes can be detected as the tissue slides across the mandible. Note tenderness, size, mobility, and attachment to the surrounding tissue. Use the same technique to examine the submandibular lymph node on the other side of the head. Okay. Locating the sternomastoid muscles. Examine the muscle on each side of the neck separately. To locate the muscle, ask the patient to turn her head to one side with the chin tipped slightly downward. The muscle should be apparent along the side of the neck. Support the patient's head by cupping her chin in your free hand. If necessary, the patient may assist the examiner by holding her hair back. The origin, body, and insertion of the muscle should be examined. Palpating the sternomastoid muscles. Palpate the insertion of the muscle behind the ear by using the fingers of one hand to apply circular compressions. Use by digital compression to palpate the body of the muscle by squeezing it between the fingers and thumb of one hand. Palpate the points of origin of the muscle by applying compression with the index and middle fingers. Note any tenderness to palpation. Tenderness can indicate a state of tension and may be due to the presence of myofascial pain dysfunction. Tenderness could also be due to the lymph nodes that lie against the muscles. Repeat this procedure for the sternomastoid muscle on the other side of the head. Okay. Visual examination of the cervical lymph nodes of the neck. Stand in front of the patient. The patient's head should be tilted back. Visually examine the entire neck from the chin to the clavicle for masses, discolorations, or scars. Palpation of the cervical lymph nodes of the neck. Examine the nodes on each side of the neck separately. Stand behind 
or beside the patient. Ask the patient to tip her head forward and slightly to the left. Palpate the anterior chain of the lymph nodes on the right side of the neck by pressing the area medial to the sternomastoid muscle with the fingertips. The fingers are rotated back and forth over the muscle, covering its entire length. With the patient's head in the same position, examine the cervical lymph nodes in the posterior triangle on the right side of the neck. The nodes of the posterior triangle are palpated by positioning the fingertips under or behind the muscle and applying compression along its entire length. Repeat this sequence to examine the anterior and posterior node chains on the left side of the patient's neck. The supraclavicular nodes. The supraclavicular lymph nodes are felt by tipping the patient's chin down slightly to relax the muscles in her neck. Use your index and middle fingers to apply circular compression in the area above the clavicle. Palpate the supraclavicular nodes on the other side of the neck in a similar manner. The larynx. Place the fingers and thumb of one hand on either side of the larynx and move it slowly from side to side. In hmm. some patients, this action may produce a clicking sound. If this should occur, the hygienist should assure the patient that this sound is completely normal. The larynx should lie in the midline of the neck. Tumor masses in the neck may push the larynx to one side. Inspect for deviations in position by placing a finger alongside the larynx and note the space between the finger and the sternomastoid muscle. Compare with the other side. The spaces should be equal. Ask the patient to swallow. The larynx should rise and fall as the patient swallows. Ask the patient if she has noticed any changes in voice pitch or persistent hoarseness in the last few months. Note any lack of mobility. Make note of any symptoms reported by the patient. Upon completion of the extraoral clinical examination, the dental hygienist should record all findings in the patient's chart and bring them to the attention of the dentist.